Hello, it's Scott Manley here. If you're a follower of science fiction, then you'll certainly be aware of the well-worn trope of the escape pod, the space-based analogue of the traditional wet lifeboat, which offers a chance of survival when your spacecraft is crippled. Indeed, the original Star Wars trilogy practically hinges on the droids fleeing on an escape pod and making it to Tatooine with the Death Star plans, thanks in part to the Empire's strict rationing of laser bolts to help pay for the Death Star. And in real life, engineers were designing escape systems since the earliest days of spaceflight. I mean, if you look at any rocket, we have the launch escape systems for the most dangerous portion of the flight, where the crew are riding a booster loaded with propellant through the thick atmosphere at supersonic speeds. Pulling the crew clear from this to land via a parachute is the launch escape system's job. But handling an emergency involving a crippled spacecraft in orbit is a completely different problem to solve. And there was no shortage of ideas for this situation. Survival equipment is something that you would carry on board the main spacecraft and it would, should be as light as possible so as not to impact the rest of the mission. On-orbit escape concepts were therefore necessarily austere. After all, the space capsules used in the early days of the space program were pretty small. It's sometimes said that the Mercury spacecraft was, wasn't so much something you occupied as it was something you wore. The most famous escape system from this era was MOOSE. Uh, that was an acronym for Man Out of Space Easily. And it says easily, not safely or sanely for that matter. I mean, while it was never developed into a working product, just thinking about it was something that clearly put astronauts into the category of superheroes. Using Moose would involve an astronaut in the spacesuit stepping out of the hatch into orbit with a suitcase-sized kit. They would strap themselves into it, pull a cord, and that would deploy an inflatable foam heat shield. And then, using a handheld propulsion system and a whole lot of badassery, they would deorbit de themselves, ride through re-entry, and land under a parachute, hopefully somewhere in the world that they could be rescued, and ideally close to a place where they can get a drink. And I'm sure that Gordon Cooper could have managed that easily. While this sounds like some wacky outlier, there were actually several variants of this idea proposed at different times by different people. There was the Paracone, which eliminated that parachute by using a larger heat shield. The GE Life Raft had three astronauts together on a similar system, and the Egress took the encapsulated ejection seats from the B-58 and added a heat shield and deorbit motors, but thankfully no bear. Again, there were no shortage of ideas, but none of them got developed. Now, the Apollo program did have a couple of lifeboat scenarios that were fleshed out with real hardware. Most famously, Apollo 13 was an actual survival scenario where they used the lunar module as a lifeboat when the command module was crippled early in the mission. This was more an exercise in procedures to use the hardware that was already there. Now, less well known was the Lunar Escape System, which was a minimalist vehicle conceived to be able to launch astronauts back to lunar orbit if the lunar module failed on the surface of the Moon. This is best imagined as a rocket-powered lawn chair with inflatable tanks that would be loaded with the fa from the failed lunar module. Lots of testing was actually made to figure out what instrumentation and controls were needed, and they included one concept where the pilot would actually stand and steer the whole thing by leaning to the side to adjust the center of mass. None of these actually got built or flown. But in the 1980s, when they were planning Space Station Freedom, the idea of a dedicated escape system became a core requirement. The space station needed crew safety systems designed into it, Unlike Skylab, the plan was to ferry crew to the station on the space shuttle and then leave them there while the shuttle returned to Earth. Initially, it had been thought that all the station would have needed was a secure, safe haven where the crew could retreat during an emergency while they waited to be rescued by a shuttle. But the Challenger disaster made it clear that a quick rescue by a shuttle could not be guaranteed and the crew needed an independent way to return if the shuttle was grounded. Now, on the ISS today, crew have return spacecraft always available, usually the spacecraft that they launched in, which stays on orbit for the typical six-month mission. 
There's a rule that means that there always has to be enough seats and spacecraft for anyone on the station. So in the rare cases where a spacecraft has to undock and move to another docking port, all the crew assigned to it have to actually board it for this small trip just in case there's a problem that could cause the ship to be unable to return and dock to the station. But this kind of thing wasn't possible with the space shuttle. It could not remain on the space station for months at a time because it had limited consumables. The longest shuttle mission was STS-80, which spent 17 days and 16 hours in space, helped along by the extended duration orbiter pallet, which was in the payload bay and added a bunch of extra hydrogen and oxygen tanks for the fuel cells. The fuel cells were probably the primary problem. They provided power to the spacecraft by reacting hydrogen and oxygen. And while some shuttles had the ability to draw power from the space station, the shuttle still needed to run those fuel cells to keep them at the operating temperature. And even if there were a way to start those fuel cells on orbit from cold, the hydrogen would also evaporate over time. Well, I don't doubt that it would be possible to build a long duration version of the space shuttle or develop it. After all, we have the X-37B, which is operated on orbit for more than a year at a time. But it would have been a huge technical undertaking to review all of the systems and to make design changes to make it possible. Like Even when they built Endeavour to replace Challenger, they constructed it using spare parts rather than building new ones because the supply chain for the space shuttle had already moved on to other things. So for space station freedom, engineers considered a number of options to provide a crew return capability. First of all, there was the SCRAM, the Station Crew Return Alter Alternative Module. It was a cylindrical cabin with a heat shield that sort of extended out past the walls of the cylinder. This design had the advantage of being the cheapest and easiest to build, uh, but the downside was that it would use a ballistic re-entry and that led to very high G-loads on the crew. Now the G-loading on an escape ship was actually more important than you might initially imagine because if this was an emergency situation, the crew might be injured and high G-loading could make any medical problems worse. Another capsule idea was based on the return capsules used by the Corona program. After all, those had had a lot of testing and they were very well understood. Now, obviously, you'd have to scale them up a bit since they were delivering people rather than just photographic film. Again, in this case, the, the entry loading would be very high. They also considered resurrecting the Apollo command module, albeit with the latest in 1980s technology, which you know, I guess might mean some more compact electronics to replace the guidance computer. This would have been smaller than the other options, possibly requiring multiple lifeboats on the station, and it was designed to land on water, which meant that the recovery was more complicated than the others. Now, the Apollo module had already been uh, looked at as a rescue vehicle. It was a five-seat variant where they removed some storage lockers and added two extra seats, and that was considered for use with Skylab 3 after they suffered problems with uh, one of the reaction control thrusters. In addition to the capsules, there were a couple of space plane designs. And space planes have the advantage of large cross-range capability, which means that after re-entry, they can move off their orbital track to find landing sites. Also, because they have wings, they have lower G-loading, which helps uh, you know crew that are possibly injured. So there was the HL-20 space plane, and that could carry eight crew, and it was you're really capable. Indeed, it had been pitched as a mini shuttle at one point, which could be launched as a standalone vehicle. And, you know, with a bit of development, it could actually evolve into a crew ferry in its own right. So the HL-20 was derived from the Soviet Bohr space plane. And this is very similar to the Dream Chaser, albeit a bit bigger and more expensive. Congress killed this in 1990 because of the price. But there was a much simpler space plane design, and that was based on the X-24A lifting body that was tested in the 1960s. This was a lot simpler. It would be carried into orbit in the payload bay of the space shuttle and left docked to the station. While it would fly like a shuttle during re-entry, it would land using a power wing at a much lower speed and that would give it many more places to land. But ultimately in 1990, none of these were developed because the space station Freedom became the International Space Station. 
And with Russia becoming a partner on the program, one of the things that they could provide was the Soyuz, a well-tested space vehicle that could fit the role as a lifeboat. It was thought that the space shuttle could carry a pair of Soyuz up to the station with a crew of astronauts and dock those to the station. Of course, the Soyuz still had the problem of a six-month life on orbit, primarily because of the hydrogen peroxide propellant in the descent module. So the Soyuz mod idea ultimately didn't work out, and about 95-96, NASA again begins to look at homegrown return vehicles. And the option they decide to go with was the space plane with the para wing. It would be known as the Assured Crew Recovery Vehicle. And its proponents thought that it could be developed for about $600 million, which was honestly quite a bargain. The vehicle would be known as the X-38, and it could take six crew from the space station back to Earth. It was about nine meters long, had a mass of 11 tons, and had a dorsal hatch for the crew to access. Uh, and it would be mated to a three-ton uh, deorbit propulsion system module that would pre perform the initial attitude control and deorbit. It would be fully automated, it would use GPS to guide the vehicle from orbit to the landing, it had batteries that would last about 9 hours, more than enough for it to find a landing site, and it made extensive use of like pre-existing electronics to keep the, you know, you know, keep the cost down. So the vehicle was expected to re-enter and fly like a plane until it slowed to a velocity of about Mach 0.8. Then it would deploy drogue chutes, and then as it slowed down further, the powering would deploy, and then it would actually deploy in stages to ensure that the loads were kept uh, low enough to avoid damage during the deployment. Then it would glide down to the ground and land at a speed of about 65 kilometers per hour. So various test articles were built and flown. There was a, a pair of large scale models built by scaled composites, which were used as drop tests uh, to verify the vehicle aerodynamics and test the powering. We actually have footage from these tests, but this was the early days of the internet, and all I can find is 320 by 240 resolution potato vision. Yeah. While the while it was actually sold as a simple return vehicle, it was also pointed out that the design could be fleshed out into a fully capable human launch vehicle, and the European Space Agency were apparently interested in that possibility, thinking that they could put it on top of an Ariane 5. This was a long time after the Hermes program had stalled. But yeah, after the drop tests were completed in 1999, the next step was to be an orbital test, and that would be to deploy it from the Space Shuttle payload bay and demonstrate a safe, automated return to Earth. This was planned for 2002, but instead, the vehicle was cancelled that year. You see, in 2001, the US commitment to the International Space Station was way over budget, and Congress wanted this fixed. And this resulted in the US unilaterally deciding to cut back on its commitments to the station, removing three components that it had promised to international partners. So the US habitation module, the centrifuge facility, and the assured crew return vehicle were all removed. The thing is, the ACRV was about 80 to 90% done. It didn't really save them that much money uh, at the time, but cancelling it did have a huge impact further down the line. A year after the cancellation, the Columbia disaster threw all the plans for the station into disarray, but the station was kept crewed by Soyuz. Eventually, President Bush set a retirement date for the space shuttle, allowing it to fly for ISS construction missions and then a single mission to service the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, US payloads like satellites had been able to move over to expendable rockets. The, the shuttle was still the US's only way to launch humans into space. There might have been an argument that if the ACRV was on the station, they could have kept it flying to deliver crew to the International Space Station before a replacement was available. But I'm going to say probably not, because the shuttle would have made a pretty expensive crew ferry compared to the humble Soyuz. But without the ACRV, there wasn't even a realistic option of keeping the shuttle flying. So for now, the idea of the dedicated space lifeboat or escape pod has gone away. The ship that takes you to space is usually the ship that takes you back in an emergency. And you might wonder if space travel would be safer if there were backup options. And the truth is, these spacecraft are the backup options. 
with redundant systems and extra hardware to handle all sorts of contingencies and make sure that they can get you home safely in any emergency. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.